excited to be here again and to uh, see you people and have the opportunity to present some of um, our new data or my uh, understanding um, on the mechanisms of how vitamin C, high dose intravenous vitamin C work on the cancer cells. Um, a few years ago, as uh, uh, Ron said that I've been here in this vitamin C symposium, and that time I was super excited about, wow, vitamin C really kills cancer cells. We see that in our experiments. But you guys have already been practiced it for years, and you know that in patient, how wonderful it is, and it works. It works to reduce cancer, it works to um, improve quality of life, but at that time, still the conventional medical society, I mean still now, the uh, resistance is reducing, which is very uh, encouraging to see, but still now they are not fully accepted this concept. So we're trying to provide data uh, to convince them <laughs> or, you know, to get this uh, as a more, um, to let more people know this and to understand the scientific basis of it. So as you probably know better uh, than me about this history, the Linus Pauling advocates for using of high dose vitamin C to treat cancer. He used it both IV and orally. And then uh, Mayo Clinic did two formal trials, uh, placebo controlled double blind, and both trials failed. That's because they use it only orally. And then uh, now, that's why the uh, conventional medical society has not been uh, so open-minded for this therapy for many years. But now you all know that this wins, right? So this wins uh, at least partially because of work uh, from Mark Levin, who's uh, happened to be my postdoctoral mentor. So um, he did this experiment. Now in healthy, um, Men and women, there's a, uh, the men in the uh, open cycle, the women in the, in the uh, dark cycle here. Vitamin C, oral ingestion, healthy people, is, uh, the concentration in the plasma is tightly controlled. So he named this tight control um, mechanism. So if you ingest, uh, if you have a healthy diet, you will probably have your uh, plasma concentration saturated. You eat more vitamin C, it's just excreted through your kidney. It does not absorb the first thing, and then it gets excreted uh, through kidney. But if you give it intravenously, it will form very high peak. Look at this, this is minimal. Now, previously, the uh, unit here is micromolar. So this scale is a thousand times higher. So you, it can get very high peak, and then your kidney excreted during time, but you have a window of a couple of hours that your system is exposed to this high uh, concentration of vitamin C. And then for comparison, uh, like Linus Pauling did, he takes six grams a, uh, a day, three times a day, so that's 18 grams, you, your plasma concentration is flat compared to the IV use. Now, does that really make the difference? Does the IV kill uh, cancer cell and how? So let me just remind you the chemistry of uh, the vitamin C here. So this is vitamin C molecule ionized in solution in water. So vitamin C as a Antioxidant, it's a famous antioxidant because it gives out electrons. It gives out two electrons step by step. So with the first st uh, electron giving out, it becomes a radical, a free radical. It's called ascorbic radical. And then with the second electron gives out, it's oxidized to dehydroascorbate. So as you know, the dehydroascorbate here has a structure uh, very similar to glucose, so it can be transported by glucose transporter either. So vitamin C itself is transported by the sodium-dependent vitamin C transporters, or SVCTs. So we can detect the radical uh, by EPR. And then these steps are uh, reversible. But then when, if the ring is broken here, then vitamin C goes down degradation and being excreted. 
So we think the high dose intravenous vitamin C uh, does a thing. So it's not, it's um, exceed, it go beyond its antioxidant function. It has a pro-oxidant function here. As you know, vitamin C gives out electron, so if you have high dose, high concentration in your bloodstream, this can be distributed into the tissue side. So at the tissue side, it gives out an electron, and the electron is uh, passed through some catalyst, which this is not um, identified yet. I just put a ferric there, for example. So uh, to pass to the uh, molecular oxygen, and the oxygen becomes a superoxide radical, and the superoxide radical be dismutated to hydrogen peroxide. As you can see here, vitamin C generates hydrogen peroxide, and the hydrogen peroxide go, uh, uh, go to uh, exert all the uh, cell killing functions I'll mention later. And then in the blood, this is not happening. That's the beauty of it. So in the blood, uh, first, the red cell has an um, a enzyme activity called semi-ascorbic radical reductase, which will prevent the radical from happening. So the first electron will be prevented to, to leave uh, the ascorbic. And then even if this chemistry happens, there's a tons of catenases, glutathione peroxidases, you know, system to take care of the hydrogen peroxide in the bloodstream. We even like, in, we took blood and then uh, put hydrogen peroxide in it and you cannot recover it with uh, devices. You cannot detect it, it's instantly gone. So the beauty of this is that high dose intravenous ascorbate can work as a delivery system, safely deliver your hydrogen peroxide to your tissue site without forming this molecule in the blood or causing any damage to your blood cells. Now this is evidence. So this is a radical formation. You can see this line is in your tissue site. It's like, not your tissue site, I mean rat and mouse, right? So uh, both rat and mouse fit in here. And the, the uh, pink dots, I didn't draw a line here, but you can see it's still basically a line, is in the tumor tissue, the radical. And then the red or dark red dots are in the blood. So you can see even when you inject a lot of vitamin C to reach 40, 50 millimolars in the blood, it doesn't form any radical. And then the hydrogen peroxide is formed too. These are in mice, tumor bearing mice. So this line is in tumor. As you can see, although it does not have uh, more radical in the tumor tissue, it does form more hydrogen peroxide in the tumor tissue. And this is in your normal tissue. So this is formed. So we go ahead to see whether this kills cancer cells. So we tested a bunch of them. You probably see this, this 48 cancer cell panel with human cancers and rodent cancers, and we have five normal cells as a comparison. So the bar shows the sensitivity, called IC50, means uh, the concentration needed to kill half of the cell in the Petri dish. So the lower the bar, the more, dense, the, the more sensitive the cells are. So you can see that over 75% of the cancer cell we tested respond to vitamin C under 10 milligram, which is very achievable with your IV infusing, right? And then all the normal cells doesn't care, even if you raise it to 20, 20 millimolar. So if we look at, this is to show you in more detail, or this is a, a ovarian cancer cell panel. This is a pancreatic cancer cell panel. So all the, the lines drop down, showing the cell viability going down as you increase the ascorbate concentration. And this green line is a normal ovarian epithelial cell line. So there's a difference between normal cell and cancer cell. And again, here's the uh, pancreatic cancer cell line. The cell uh, viability drop down as you increase ascorbate concentration. And then here's uh, a few normal cells, lymphocyte, um, um, a pancreatic ductal epithelial cell, normal cell, and then um, a cell, a, a cancer cell that you add a catalyst there, because catalyst takes care of hydrogen peroxide. If you don't have hydrogen peroxide present in there, you don't have any cell deaths. 
as I said, hydrogen peroxide is the key. So um, this is in a lymphoma cell. So you add a two millimolar of ascorbate to it, uh, it almost killed everybody. This is a cell death, almost 100%. And then if you add catalyst, which takes care of a hydrogen peroxide, you completely protect the cell from vitamin C induced cell deaths. So this is a pro proof that um, vitamin C induced cancer cell deaths through generation of hydrogen peroxide by the mechanism I showed a few slides ago. Now we also, uh, because now uh, you cannot, at least in the US, you cannot avoid chemotherapy to a cancer patient, right? Whether uh, it's good or not, you guys know better than me, but the fact is that you cannot use ascorbic alone as a first line treatment uh, in a uh, cancer patient. So we uh, look at wh whether ascorbic will induce or interfere with the first nine chemotherapies. So you can see here, this is a um, olaparib, which is a POP inhibitor. So at this concentration we use, this is a ovarian cancer cell line. Ascorbate Q, uh, we don't use too much. I forgot the number, maybe two or three minimoner. So killed 50%, and at this concentration, olaparib, uh, this is a relevant concentration to the clinical use. This cell line is resistant to, uh, to, to the PARP inhibitor, and then if you combine ascorbate and PARP inhibitor, you significantly increase the sensitivity of this cancer cell. And at, of course, you use catalyst, you lose the effect. And this, this is with carbo planting in another uh, ovarian cancer cell line, again, uh, ascorbate here, couple planting here, and then you add them together, it kills every cell. And then this is in a pancreatic cancer cell with gem, gemza, gemcitabine. So this cell is resistant to gemcitabine, as you can see, with the concentration increase, the cell doesn't die much. But if you add ascorbate to it, you can see, this, the deaths just significantly increased. Or well, this is to show you again, just in a different format. I'm not going to detail. This is to show you combination uh, index. This is a three cell lines. This is a normal cell line. So the normal cell line, if you add ascorbate and uh, couple planting, adding them together, it doesn't increase toxicity at all. So this is in cell. Oh, again, show you more. This is a, a HDAC inhibitor. So uh, you, this, uh, this is called combination index. If it's less than 0 0.1, we see there's a synergy. If it's uh, around one, the effect is additive. If it's uh, bigger than one, it's um, antagonist, antagonistic. So you can see that as the concentration of ascorbate goes up, and then if you, as the, uh, the HDAC inhibitor concentration goes up, they, um, they have synergy or additive uh, to synergistic effects. So how about in animals? So that's in cell culture, right? So this is a, an example. There are tons of animal study published now. It's very solid now. This is just an example of ours. So this is a pancreatic cancer. What do you do? What we did is we inject human pancreatic cancer cells into the pancreas of a neuter mouse, an immunosuppromised uh, mouse. So it developed tumor there and it metastasized to liver, just mimicking the uh, human um, disease process. So uh, then we treat it with either gemcitabine alone, with ascorbate alone, or with the two drug combination. So control is not treated. So you can see this is at the beginning, this is after two weeks, this is after uh, five weeks. So you can see the difference there, right? And then if you quantify the tumor intensity, here's the um, control, here's gemcitabine, which did nothing. Uh, here's um, ascorbate and ascorbate plus gemcitabine. It's basically just the ascorbate effect showing here. And here's the, uh, the tumor, final tumor weight. We took the tumor out at the end and weighed them because we are afraid that the imaging is not 100% uh, uh, related to the realistic tumor burden. 
But then it should show you the same thing. Gemcitabine did nothing. Ascorbic reduced 50% of the tumor growth here. And if you add them together, it's n at least not uh, interfere with the gemcitabine effects, which is like no effect here. So, and this is a metastasis. You can see control. This is the number of metastases that we can count in the liver, and this gemcitabine did nothing again, and ascorbate alone significantly reduced the lesions. And then you add them together, it's the same thing showing the ascorbate effect. And another sample is in the metastatic ovarian cancer. So this model, this mouse model is we inject, again, human ovarian cancer cells into the abdomen of the mice, so they develop massive uh, um, ascites and the tumors in the, in, the, in the abdomen cavity, which mimic the end stage of ovarian cancer, which you have massive metastasis already. And then we treat them with ascorbate alone, with carboplantin, with pacnitaxel, and with ascorbate plus carboplantin, ascorbate plus pacnitaxel, and carboplantin plus pacnitaxel, which is the first line of chemotherapy. And then this three drug combined together. You can see that this is the tumor burden at the end. And then you can see this is ascites volume. And here, uh, this part is too small here, so I brought it up in the insert. You can see in the insert that pacnitaxel, you still have some residue. Uh, of pacnitaxel is very good in this model. Still have some residue uh, ascites, but you add ascorbate to it, completely clear the ascites, which is dramatic. So again, this is we count how many cancer cells in there, the same effect you can see. If you combine three drugs together, it's, it's clean. And then this panel shows you as the treatment, all the treatment here, Ascorbate with ascorbate or without ascorbate does not cause any uh, pathological change in liver, in kidney, and in spleen. Okay, now you have more cases here in there in the clinical research, <laughs> but I would still like to talk about a few of our trials in our hands. So this uh, first, of course, after the animal study, you bring it to human, you need to look at safety, although we already know that it's safe, you still need to prove to the FDA it's safe. So um, there are, I don't know how visible this slide is to you, but this an uh, 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 incomplete list at least more than 12, maybe more than 30 now, uh, small uh, either observational study or uh, phase one clinical trial using high dose, at least 10 grams. Some goes to 75 grams, some goes to 125 grams. All says safe, 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 all tolerated. And then all says that improve quality of life, improve quality of life, improve quality of life, reduce the toxicity there. So safety, we have no problem at all. And then shows you here is a trial that we did at the KU Medical Center. It's in ovarian and cancer. So this is a randomized trial with two arms. One is uh, carboplantin plus pacintaxel. This is newly diagnosed uh, stage three to four ovarian cancer. And then, or pancreatexo plus, uh, plus carboplantin plus ascorbate. So this trial is a phase one. It's not uh, powered to look at efficacy, where our aim is, again, to look at the toxicity and uh, tolerance. It's very, ascorbate is very well tolerated. And surprisingly, it, or not surprisingly, it reduced the chemo-associated toxicity here. So this is grade one toxicity. You can see the, the chemo, chemo plus ascorbate. Grade two, chemo, chemo uh, plus ascorbate. Significantly reduced. At most severe stage, we have rare cases of those, but uh, the ascorbate at least doesn't increase it. And then for all the categories uh, that the toxicity is evaluated about, you all have decreased with ascorbate added to the chemotherapy.
And then also this is published earlier, so we did a survey. Maybe you, this is you guys' data, and then your all the practitioners' data. So how much patient you treat, how many complaints you have for the toxicity, very minimal, minimal. You can see no complaints or complaints. The majority is fatigue there, and which can resolve in a short time after the infusion has been stopped. And then this one is questionable because this is reported by uh, one single practitioner and without detailed descriptions there. So it means that it's in wide use. It's very safe. And then the next thing you want to look at is to look at your PK, yeah, pharmacokinetics in the in a patient half-life, uh, AUC, uh, the clearance, all that, how much, uh, the uh, Cmax, the highest concentration you can achieve. It's also done. And uh, um, with intravenous infusing of 75 to 100 uh, grams, you can safely reach 20 to 30 minimoner blood concentration, peak blood concentration, which is plenty to kill cancer cell, like as we show in our cell and animal data. And then the half-life is about two to, two to four hours. So some has a concern that if I inject people so much of ascorbate, okay, it's safe. But the, the, the patient is having chemotherapy at the same time. Does it influence the uh, pharmacokinetics of the chemo drug, right? Drug drug interaction concern. So we look at Gemza in our phase one clinical trial. It says no, it does not interact with gemcitabine pharmacokinetics. So gemcitabine alone only exists in the bloodstream for a very short time. The half-life is about 16 minutes because it's fast metabolized to the, uh, to the uh, uh, DFDU. It's called the, it's a, the major metabolite, which is the active form. So the active form can exist for, um, let's see here, for about uh, 15 hours, so the half-life is 15 hours more. So we look at both gemcitabine itself and the active metabol metabolite of gemcitabine. So um, does, uh, IVC does not influence Cmax, which is the, uh, the, the peak concentration of gemcitabine, does not influence the AUC area on the curve, which is the bioavailability or the expo real exposure of uh, the drug. And the, but it does decrease the half-life for about one minute because it's 16 minutes total. So it's uh, mathematically significant, but I don't think this, this has any clinical meaning of this reduce. So more importantly is the uh, uh, metabolite, the, uh, the DFDU, does not influence Cmax, does not influence AUC, does not influence half-life at all. So, um, this is to look at the other way, whether the gemcitabine influences ascorbate pharmacokinetics. And then gemcitabine doesn't influence the, uh, high, the, the peak concentration or the Cmax of ascorbate, but it does increase uh, the, a little bit uh, of the ascorbate excretion. So ascorbate does not influence gemcitabine pharmacokinetics, but with gemcitabine, your ascorbate is excreted faster. So the efficacy. So now there's, there has been many small-scale trials, case report, all showing, or, uh, showing very encouraging result. But then the conventional oncologist still doesn't accept it fully because they want to see a, um, a properly powered, statistically powered, double-blind, placebo-controlled you know, trial. There has not been that we're working on. Uh, to get funding, hopefully, to, to, to have one, because we have so many um, data accumulated. This is data from the ovarian cancer trial that I talked about. So you can see the survival, five-year survival, of the uh, chemotherapy and then chemo plus ascorbate, uh, showing no difference with ascorbate, probably slightly better, uh, because there are too few patients to show the difference. So if there is a difference and there's a variation, 
uh, a variation of the survival is big, so you need a um, larger number. Our trial doesn't have uh, enough number of patients to show an efficacy here. But encouragingly, you, if you see the time to relapse, there is, there is a eight, almost 8.5 months difference. If you add ascorbate, you have 8.5 months longer of disease-free or, or uh, time to relapse time there. So this is very encouraging. And more encouraging is our, in our recently published uh, pancreatic cancer trial. So this is a one-arm trial. So uh, the, the patient failed chemo. They either failed GEMSA or they failed Phophororex, the, the four-drug combination for pancreatic cancer. So uh, we recruit them again. This is the one that we did the drug-drug interaction with gemcitabine. So this is still a phase one trial, but very encouragingly, you can see that the survival, the medium survival of ascorbate plus gemcitabine, we have to treat them, put them on gemcitabine again, because uh, we are not allowed to just use ascorbate on them. You can see that it reached, in this patient reached 15 months. With the best newly FDA approved uh, therapy of nabopaclitaxel plus gemcitabine, the, trial, the uh, published trials only have about nine months. So it means that um, this is a small trial. Um, this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, still being argued by many uh, oncologists there, but this is very encouraging. This says at least we need to do a bigger trial to prove this for, to them. So this is one patient in that trial. This patient had a, a field for phononox and they had a disease progression. So this is this layer in the pancreas. And then this, this is um, gems, uh, on gemcitabine and uh, ascorbate. So you can see the tumor uh, had an in interval decrease of mass. And at the end, uh, she had the tumor removed by surgery. By surgery, by surgery. At, at the beginning, she was not eligible uh, for surgery because the tumor involves uh, an artery there in the pancreas. But at the end, the doctors de uh, decided it's clear enough that she can have the tumor removed, and she had the surgery. And this is another case that we reported. Uh, he had only ascorbate treatment, no chemotherapy, no radiation therapy, no immunotherapy or whatever, because he chose to just do ascorbate treatment. So this is at the enrollment. At, well, at the beginning of the treatment in 2007, this is a stage four uh, pancreatic cancer. But you all know how bad that disease is, right? Usually people die in a few months, three to six months, that's all. And this is the lagging in the pancreas, and this is the liver. I don't know if it's clear enough to you, but there's like multiple lagging. The biggest one measured 2.8 times 1.8 centimeter. And then after a few months of ascorbate, that you can see the uh, SUV, which means the metab metabolic um, activity of the tumor decreased. The original tumor doesn't change size, but the liver lesion is much better. And then he continues, the, the liver continues to get better, getting better, and after a year and a half, so for him to live a year and a half, it's already like unexpected by all the medical uh, uh, caregivers. And then his liver lesions are totally gone, so it's resolved. And then the, uh, the original uh, tumor, the uh, metabolic activity decreases, but it comes back again, but the size doesn't change. And at last, he had the tumor removed. Also. So this is another case of uh, prostate cancer. So this is at the beginning of the, at the diagnosis. So you can see how hot this area is. This is a tumor area. This is a PET scan. And then this is uh, after 23 doses of very intensive uh, uh, vitamin C only treatment. 
you can see the metabolic activity of the tumor massively decreased, and this patient had surgery also. So that's just some proof adding to your experience that vitamin C is working. So we get all uh, like very often asked about these questions. So why cancer cells are killed but not normal cells? Does every cancer does every cancer respond, or does every one respond? How do I know who to choose, who would like me to benefit from this treatment? Because it's intense. You need to give it intravenous um, frequently, right? So if we can choose the patient, we can, pre pre we, we can predict who's going to benefit more or the most, then that will be a very helpful information. So that, those questions are driving us to look at the mechanism of like indeed how after vitamin C formed hydrogen peroxide, where does it heat in the cancer cell which doesn't heat the normal cell? And then hopefully through that mechanistic study we can develop some biomarkers clinically to help uh, to select a patient or to uh, predict the prog prognosis. So now, for our understanding, there are many, many papers published in this area. Um, I think uh, vitamin C is a multi-target agent. It does not target only one thing in the cell. It targets multiple places. Um, as Dr. McNova gave you a talk yesterday, he, he uh, summarized a lot. So I'm just going to focus on these four aspects. So it causes direct cancer cell death. It has a metabolic inhibition to cancer cell. It has some, uh, um, it has anti-metastasis feature, and it inhibits cancer stem cell. So let's go through it. So we know that ascorbate forms hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is an ROS, so it goes to damage DNA. So when, when DNA is damaged, there's an a oxidative DNA damage sensor. Uh, two of them are ATM and ATR. There's the earnest one. They get phosphorylated. And this phosphorylation will influence another molecule called AMPK. AMPK is also a, it's a sensor of uh, ATP, ADP ratio in the cell. So this get phosphorylated, and it will inhibit mTOR, which is a central regulator for protein synthesis. So when mTOR is inhibited, the cells cannot synthesize the protein. So of course, it cannot divide, it cannot grow, just simply speaking. And also, hydrogen peroxide can deplete cancer cell ATP, which I'll uh, talk in a detail a little bit later. So this is to show, this is to show you the uh, uh, the evidence that the uh, ascorbate is, called, uh, is causing DNA damaging and then causing this uh, pathway activation. So as I said, AETM is the only uh, sensor of uh, uh, oxidative DNA damage. It's get phosphorylated. You can see the phosphorylation of uh, ATM goes up uh, dose dependently and time dependently on ascorbate. Of course, it shows up and then it goes down uh, during time, but it's, when it's activated, it triggers the downstream signaling pathways. So this is a DNA damage, uh, double-strand DNA damage sensor. Um, if it's get phosphorylated, the DNA is damaged. It goes up, concentration dependent, and time dependent to ascorbic treatment. So this is an assay to show you the real, you can really see uh, the, D, the DNA damage. Uh, this is called the single cell uh, DNA electrophoresis. So if the DNA is damaged, DNA is a large molecule. So if it's chopped, then if you do electrophoresis, the, the, the fragment will migrate out of the nuclear. And then you can see a tail. So we call it the comet assay. So you can see like a, a comet. So the, the bigger the tail, the more damage there is. So we do ascorbate treatment, carboplantin treatment, ascorbate plus carboplantin, POP inhibitor, the three adding together, and you add a catalyst to control to see where the hydrogen peroxide is there. So uh, in summary, you can see that uh, the red pie there is uh, the damage is severe enough 
to definitely cause cell death. So it's grade three to four. Uh, the number two, grade two, the, the, it might go through DNA repairment to fix it. So you can see ascorbate can cause it, couple planting not too much. If you add them together, you add the pop inhibitor, so you, you have um, a lot of DNA damage in the cancer cells. And then also talk about it, uh, redu it reduces the cancer DNA. So this, uh, I'm sorry, ATP. So you can see that these are in a cancer cell, uh, ovarian cancer cell. This is, is in a uh, normal ovarian epithelial cell. So it only <coughs> decreases ATP in cancer cell, but does not decrease ATP in a normal cell. And then the decreasing of the ATP and the DNA damaging causing AMPK um, activation. So mTOR inhibition, dose dependent and time dependent to ascorbate treatment. So it is evident. So I want to show you uh, that the DNA damaging is, uh, is presenting here. So I want to talk a little bit more about the metabolic inhibition. How does ascorbate uh, inhibit uh, ATP in cancer cell, but not in normal cell? So showing you here the evidence of inhibiting in cancer cells, these are uh, two pancreatic cancer cell line. This is a normal pancreas ductal epithelial cell. You can see only the cancer cells ATP drop with ascorbic treatment, but then the, uh, this is a concentration. The normal cell doesn't. Then again, this is in a, uh, in a neuroblastoma cell. You can see that with, with a different concentration of ascorbic, it, it drop. Uh, this is control. So why we think it's still hydrogen peroxide related? So DNA damage is happening, and then DNA uh, damage will trigger POP activation. So POP is to repair. POP is an enzyme to repair DNA. So POP is activated. It's going to use NAD as a substrate. So it causes NAD. Decrease. So the NAD decrease, you know NAD is a very important substrate in the glycolysis pathway, so uh, the enzyme using it is uh, uh, GAP-DH. So GAP-DH activity will go down and it causes glycolysis inhibition and why it's important in cancer cell, you know Warburg effect, cancer cell depend more on glycolysis. Uh, then the, the mitochondria is not functioning fully to produce ATP. So the, if the glycolysis is inhibited, it's going to hit cancer cells more than the normal cells. So that's why ATP drop in cancer cells, but not in normal cells, to a degree severe enough to cause cell death. And then also, as I showed, DNA damage itself, if it's not repaired, it can cause cell death. So this is evidence to show you POP activation. You know, this uh, is a product of POP. So if the product increases, that means POP is activated. This is a POP inhibitor, of course, they inhibit it. So, um, and then this is show you to the, the NAD depletion with ascorbate treatment. So this is a concentration of ascorbate during time that the NAD decrease in the cancer cell, uh, dose dependently, and then uh, gap DH activity decrease. Gap enzyme expression is not influenced, so it reduces uh, the substrate of gap DH. So it reduces the activity, but it does not influence the protein level of the enzyme. So this uh, we have cell data, but this is mouse data here. So this is uh, control mice. This is uh, scopic treated mice. So we uh, take the tumor out and measure gap DH protein level and activity level. So if the NAD depletion is so important, you add NAD back, you should rescue the cell, right? So that is like in the uh, scientific field, you have to prove, you show a phenomenon and then you have to uh, prove it again, you know? So we add NAD back. So you add NAD back here you rescue the ATP. This is in a neuroblastoma cell. So this is a control. This is the cell treated with ascorbate, the ATP drop. And then you, uh, this is with NAD alone, just as a control, seeing that NAD itself is not causing any 
thing in ADP. But then if you add NAD back to ascorbic treated cell, the ATP goes back. And then the ATP uh, goes back, the cell viability goes back. So this is a, a control, not treated. This is treated by ascorbate. This is a pancreatic cancer cell, goes down. And then if you add uh, NAD at different concentration, the, uh, uh, the, the survival of the cell goes back. This bar only here is because it's a very high ascorbate concentration for these cells, uh, and the NAD is at a low supplement concentration. You really need to supplement more to rescue all of the cell deaths here. And then also, if you, whether this is to prove to you ATP drop is also is important for the cell deaths. NAD is through in causing ATP drop, which directly causes cell deaths. If you add ATP back, you rescue the cell. So more evidence showing you that the, uh, the glucose metabolism is inhibited, glycolysis specifically is inhibited. So this is extracellular acidification rate, which measures the uh, cell medium, um, how fast it goes acidic, because uh, when the glycolysis goes on, uh, glucose going down glycolysis by the cancer cell, it produces lactate, right? So that's acid. How fast they, uh, it acidifies the, the media. So this is a control cell which uh, has no treatment. And this is injection A, that's the point we add ascorbate to it. So you add ascorbic, this is a different dose, different color shows you a different dose, and then the green line is adding hydrogen peroxide, so you can see that it uh, significantly decreases the rate, uh, the acid-producing rate of the cancer cell. And does it influence mitochondria? So this is a rough uh, measure of the mitochondria function called oxygen consumption rate, because the oxygen is the major uh, consumption by the cell is through mitochondria. So basically saying that uh, you add ascorbate treatment here, it does not really change uh, the oxygen consumption. Uh, by the mitochondria. Uh, again, this is not only mitochondria, this is a total oxygen consumption by the cell, but major contributor is mitochondria. And so, a lot of paper, there's a science paper came out in 2015 uh, by Dr. Louis Cantony saying that um, ascorbate goes in as DHA, as I showed you, it's oxidized DHA, goes in through glucose uh, transporter and then reduced back to ascorbate. Um, that can happen in some physiological condition, but if it's a real mechanism how it kills the cancer cell, then you treat the cell with DHA, it will kill the cancer cell as well, right? But no, we don't see cancer cell deaths if you add DHA to it. You have to have the reduced form of ascorbate to kill the cancer cell. So this is to show you the DHA didn't reduce gap DH activity. As ascorbate did, as a catenase protected, as hydrogen peroxide did, but DHA didn't. And also this to show you the cell death, this is in a lymphoma cell. We add ascorbate to the cell, you can see the death goes up as the concentration goes up. We use the same concentration of DHA, it did nothing. So, um, for me that, the, uh, because physiologically the cells are loaded with ascorbate if you are not ascorbate depleted, right? And then um, the changing of ascorbate concentration inside the cell by your injection, probably not so much, because cells are saturated. It can be saturated. So what matters is uh, you can dramatically change is the concentration outside of your cell, in your tissue fluid. And there, ascorbate forms hydrogen peroxide. And the hydrogen peroxide goes into the cell to have the effect. But also, the interest in ascorbate can play a role, as showing you by the Iowa group um, 
in a paper uh, recently, because uh, inside the, the ascorbate can still be oxidized um, and forms hydrogen peroxide. And then there's a positive feeding back group in cancer cell because cancer has a more leaking mitochondria who forms uh, more RS. And this RS triggers uh, the transferring receptor uh, expression on the cell surface and taking in more um, ferrum, fer ferric. And then that will uh, catalyze more ascorbate oxidation and forms more RS. And the more RS feedback, you know, positively. So this happens in cancer cell. But in normal cell, because they have lower mitochondria RS production, you, you do not initiate this uh, positive feedback group. So that's basically what their paper uh, is telling. So in this way, so your inside concentration of ascorbate might play a role. So in summary now, what do we know about the direct cell killing? is ascorbate, either forms hydrogen peroxide outside there, or it goes in through uh, ascorbate transporter or through the gl glucose transporter. Uh, I forgot to mention that there's a paper showing that the, the uh, sodium-dependent vitamin C transporter play a role in the sensitivity to ascorbate uh, treatment. So the cells that uh, express more SVCT2 are more sensitive. So that means it might get into the cell and form more hydrogen peroxide there. And then the hydrogen peroxide goes on to cause DNA damage to inhibit gap DH, uh, and then cause uh, ATP drop, NAD drop, ATP drop, and cause differentiated uh, cell death in cancer cell. And then in normal cell, this is uh, less happening. All right. So, that's the direct cell killing, and then we have evidence showing that independent of the cell killing process, that scorbate can inhibit metastasis of the cell by different mechanism. So this, this figure, you, you see it before, ascorbate gemcitabine treatment in the mice, ascorbate reduce uh, the metastasis. And then in cells, we also prove this. So this is called a Borden chamber uh, assay, which means uh, basically, simply speaking, it's a membrane. You set the cell, cancer cell above the membrane, and then the membrane has holes. The cancer cell can migrate to the bottom. So you add uh, chemo um, attraction at the bottom. Basically, it's more serum in, the, in your media. So, uh, and then you coat, or you, you don't coat, or you coat your membrane with uh, matrigel, which is a, a mimic of the extracellular matrix. So without the matrigel coating, you just measure the, the migration, the, the movement of the cell, how fast they move. With matrigel coating, you measure the real invasion ability, because the cell need to cut through the extracellular matrix. So with or without, doesn't matter, ascorbate inhibit. So it inhibit migration, it inhibit invasion, both. So this is to show you the uh, MMP is um, um, matrix material protease, which helps the cancer cell to cut through the matrix. So it decreases in activity, it decreases in protein in, in expression. And <coughs> you can imagine collagen synthesis is massively increased. So this is, uh, the, the blue stain shows you collagen. So this is a control tumor in a mouse. This is mouse with tumor treated with ascorbate. You can see in the slides. And then uh, we, we measured uh, many, many slides and show you this figure here. Um, collagen synthesis massively increased. And then this is the fibrosis in the tumor also increased. And this shows you in the liver nothing happened. So it caused more fibrosis in the tumor, and it caused more collagen synthesis in the tumor, but not influence the normal tissues. So fibrosis in the tumor is controversial in the cancer field. Some say that it helps um, cancer metastasis and uh, increase drug resistance, but some other people saying that it restricts the tumor at the site 
because there's the it forms a, like a wall that can gel. There's a tumor cell inside. There's a tumor cannot move. So what we see is that later in the uh, in our experiment, this is again to show you this is uh, the gene expression, the mRNA expression. So in our either in our mouse or in the uh, in the um, uh, patient, we both see that the tumor become more restricted. It forms, uh, in some patients, you can almost see a scar-like uh, uh, tissue or uh, formation around the tumor. So the tumor becomes like more solid, more separate, less invasive. So what was surprising to us is that we saw ascorbate induce alpha tubing acetylation. So what, does alpha tub what is alpha tubulin? It's a molecule that forms microtubulin in, uh, in the cell. So it's a part of the cell skeleton. So what the acetylation does to it? The acetylation stabilizes it. So you know that the cell skeleton needs to go dynamic of symboling, disembling, so the cell move and divide. So the cell move and then depend on it. Uh, Assemble, disassemble. So the acetonation just stiff it there. So it assemble but cannot disassemble. So we find ascorbate massively increase the acetylation in tumor cells, but not so much uh, in, um, in normal cells. But if you, you stretch it with a very high concentration, you still see that. So this is uh, the immunofluorescent. You can see the green shows you the acetylated tubing. You can see how it uh, forms the microtubule that's surrounding uh, the, the cell, the tumor cell. So this is in a normal cell. You see it much, much less. And as I said, it increases the tubing, it stabilizes the tubing um, polymerization. So this is a higher molecular weight of the tubing, means it's a, a polymerized there and not degraded. So it's uh, in two pancreatic cancer cells, you can see with the increased concentration of ascorbate, you see more of the uh, tubing polym polymerization there. It's the same effect how pancreatic work. Pacnaxo works the same way, but it doesn't. Pacnaxo work in in uh, stabilize the tube microtubule, but it binds to beta tubing. So um, ascorbate works in acetylize alpha tubing, but the effect are the same, and it stabilizes there because I uh, cold cold temperature is known to degradate it, but you can see this is not degraded by cold temperature. So it really stabilizes the cancer cell there. But then how, right? You can ask deeper, ascorbate can stabilize this, can cause acetylation of the tubing, of alpha tubing. So there are three enzymes in the process of the, the dynamic of tubing. Um, alpha TAD is to, to acetylize uh, the, uh, the, the uh, the alpha tubing, and then there are two deacetylase to cut off the acetone group. So we first check um, who's influenced. We see alpha tad is not influenced here. Alpha tad here. And then we see SIRT2 is not influenced in the protein level. And we see HDAC6, which is another, uh, is, is a deacetylase, tubing deacetylase, is decreased by ascorbate. So maybe we think, here shows you in a tumor sample, in the mouse tumor sample also. So maybe we think it is HDAX6, ascorbate is hit HDAX. So we overexpressed HDAX6. If it's HDAX6, it should be able to rescue the ascorbate caused uh, acetonation. But no, it doesn't, it didn't. So you can see that the um, uh, HDAX6 is overexpressed very much a lot, but no. So. comes this puzzle, so why? Then there's another other candidate, SIRT2. So if you look at SIRT2, although the protein level doesn't change, it needs NAD as a cofactor. So we say, aha, uh -huh, might be the NAD depletion that causes the SIRT2 activity decrease, although the protein level doesn't, the enzyme doesn't change. So there, the, um, this is to show you again the NAD decrease 
and then if you uh, supplement NAD back, uh, you, 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 this is to, sub, to see that we can really get the NAD level back. And then you supplement NAD, you probably see less acetonation caused by ascorbate, right? Yes. See, so this is a treated by ascorbate. You have massive acetonation, and then you add NAD, and you add more NAD. So it rescued the phenomenon. And then if you add again, add an AD, you rescue the cell deaths. So now we, in a summary, now we know ascorbate directly kill cancer cell. Ascorbate in, uh, inhibit metastasis by increased fibrosis, increased collagen, um, and by uh, acetonized uh, alpha tubing there. And then there are also evidence uh, by other people that uh, recently published in cell, one paper in Cell, one paper in Nature, that ascorbate activated TERT2, which can inhibit cancer stem cell growth. So I will just briefly show you one piece of data. This is my last slide, I believe, uh, that this uh, is called a tumor sphere formation, which uh, means you culture the, the tumor cells um, in a stem, stem cell culture condition suspended. So the normal cancer cell, it's weird to see normal cancer cell, but the, those cancer cells will die, but only the stem cell survive and form a colony, a spheres. So we call it tumor spheres formation. And then you count the number and you measure the size of it. So this is your control. This is a pancreatic cancer cell. This is another pancreatic cancer cell. And with a scoby treatment, you can see massively decreased both the number and the size. So, so much so, uh, IV versus oral, that is causing cancer cell deaths. I, I see that oral ascorbate has its independent value, but maybe in killing cancer cell, um, uh, I saw like a scientific evidence showing that IV works, uh, not oral. And then it's uh, caused by uh, generating hydrogen peroxide. It's already proved. And then it has a multiple target. Damaging DNA, cause ATP depletion, and it uh, influences re redox metabolism by uptaking more ferric uh, in, and then uh, have the RS even produced more. And then it in, um, interferes with the tubing dynamic. It increases collagen in tumor stroma and inhibit the cancer stem cells. Okay, my very last slide, I promise. <laughs> so these people, I own a big thanks, thanks a mini. So uh, these are the students in my lab currently, and these are my previous students or uh, postdocs or visiting scanners. They all contribute greatly uh, to, the, to the work, the data I show you today. And then the integrative medicine group in KU Medical Center, uh, Dr. Ginny Driscoll is my long-term and close collaborator uh, who did, uh, did the clinical trials. And we have a few friendly oncologists here. Uh, <laughs> Julia Chapman is a GYN oncologist at QMC, and uh, Steve is a um, GI um, a gastrointestinal uh, oncologist there. And then we have the, um, the uh, 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 pharmacokinetics person and um, a lot of other investigators uh, in the institute. And of course, uh, Mark Levin is my uh, long-term um, scientific mentor there, and I also Thanks for my funding here. And thank you all for listening. And then. So thank you very much, Dr. Uh, K. Chen, Dr. Chen. Um, I just have, we don't really have time for questions, but I have, I'm gonna ask one question. So one of the intriguing ideas that we're working on is that almost, we, we, it's very clear that IV vitamin C is more effective than oral vitamin C in this body of research. Uh, but IV vitamin C has to be given in boluses. So the, has the idea or the question occurred to you that when we bolus two times a week, are we allowing uh, resistance to form? And would we be better to bolus and then to provide some form of continuous IV vitamin C? Because this is how 
Linus Pauling and Ewan Cameron actually did their IVs. It was continuous IV infusion. Has that been uh, investigated or are you aware of that? Um, it has not, because first we cannot continuously infuse a mouse. It's very <laughs> difficult. And then um, second, if we treat in cell culture, that scorbid is gone in a few hours, it's oxidized. So um, yeah, that's a very good question and it's been a while we were thinking about it. So for the uh, first, at the very beginning, we didn't know much of the toxicity. We were afraid that continuous inf infusing will increase toxicity because you expose your system continuously to hydrogen peroxide, basically, right? Um, but with you guys' uh, evidence that it's probably not the case. Um, so the second concern is that the continuous, will it um, increase or decrease the chance of resistance? We don't know. So we probably need to think a way of doing it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much.